Hey folks, uh, it's a beautiful day, so I figure I'll record from my back deck. Um, but I've got to go over some terminology um, before we start our real study of the Wanderer. I read it to you last time uh, so that you could see the themes that work in there. Uh, but there's also um, sort of a language that we use as um, scholars to talk about literature. And you've got to learn the the language. And uh, we call the, that language literary terminology, just like other classes have terminology that you need to learn. Uh, English does as well. Uh, I'm trying to move myself around here so I'm a little better situated. Um, English does as well, and you need to learn that that terminology to be able to talk about the literature in a meaningful way. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hit you with some terms. I, I try and break them up. I don't like to give you uh, a ton of terms all at once because I feel like it's overload and it's difficult to to memorize. I had teachers who did that to me in, in high school. At the beginning of class, they were like, here's a terms list, um, learn them. And you didn't have any context to apply them to. Uh, it didn't make sense. Uh, and I didn't remember them hardly at all. So I try and chunk them out. I break them up and I try and give them to you with a poem uh, or a piece of literature that you can look at the terms and understand them. Um, you need to learn all of these things because they're going to be consistent throughout Anglo-Saxon literature. The reason we're doing Anglo-Saxon poetry first is so that you can see how the Anglo-Saxons constructed things, the sort of devices that they use and the ways that they use them, and then you can apply that when we read the bigger thing, which is Beowulf. Beowulf is this Anglo-Saxon epic that we're building up to that is sort of a, a cornerstone of British literature and everybody... Um, has read or heard about. And so in order to get you to a place where you can understand that, you've got to understand all of this terminology first and getting it in little chunks and, and applying it to Anglo-Saxon poetry along with the themes should really help you in your understandings. So uh, let's, let's try and do five terms today, uh, basic terms to understand Anglo-Saxon literature. Uh, the first term on my list is what's called oral tradition. Um, you know, you probably recognize oral from like oral surgery. It has to do with, you know, like your mouth. Uh, and so oral tradition here is, um, quote unquote, literature that comes from a, if only I could write, uh, that comes from a time before the written word. So, uh, things that come from oral tradition are, are stories that were passed down, you know, like around the campfire for hundreds or maybe longer uh, of years. And people would tell them and, and they would sort of define the culture. Uh, in Anglo-Saxon times, there were these people called scalds or bards, and they traveled uh, from sort of uh, mead hall to mead hall, from kingdom to kingdom, uh, and they would tell stories. They would stay there for a while and tell all the stories that they knew and entertain people. And in exchange, they get small amount of money and food and be taken care of. And then they would move on to a new location. And that's where sort of the stories of the culture came from. Now, what happens, interestingly, in some cultures is suddenly uh, they start to learn to read and write, and these stories get written down. And that's what occurred in, in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, they learned how to read and write using the Latin alphabet, and they started capturing these oral tradition stories, stories that would have been told for a long time um, in the written word. And, and so you end up with very sort of different things happening. Like a good example is the Iliad or the Odyssey. You guys all read the Odyssey in ninth grade, I think. And, um, you know, the Odyssey is, is what happened in ancient Greece. Uh, this guy Homer is attributed, you know, to, to the authorship of the Odyssey, but, uh, the Odyssey was probably told for three or 400 years before it was written down. And it was attributed to this blind poet Homer when it was written down. Um, but what happens when a story gets written down is it becomes static. It becomes unchanging. Um, whereas when something's an oral tradition, it's a performance art, like extemporaneous rap or something like that. So if you were listening to a poet tell the story of the Odyssey, it would be different every time it was told. Um, I got a dog here saying hi. Give me a um, it would be different every time it's told. So the poet would uh, sense when he was he was breaking through to his audience and they were really interested and he would extend that part and if there was a part where they weren't paying any attention he would he would make it go faster um, each poet would have their own individual flavor or take on the story and 
what ends up happening when it gets written down is it becomes static. It doesn't change anymore. It's always going to be the same way from here on out because you're going to read it off the page. It's uh, the easiest way to think about oral tradition versus a written tradition is maybe to think about the difference between concert versions of songs and album versions. Album versions are the same every single time you hear them. Uh, because they play off a track, whereas concert versions, you go to a concert, you hear a song you've heard a thousand times, it's going to be slightly different because in that particular concert, they decided to play it that way. And I think that's the difference between oral tradition and written tradition. So these things come from oral tradition, and they were written down and they became static. Um, next thing you need to know is alliteration. Um, like I said in the language lecture, Anglo-Saxon is a Germanic language. And as such, it doesn't rely on rhyme. German's not a rhymey language. Anybody who's ever listened to somebody speak in German, there's not a lot of rhyming going on. Rhyming comes up from Latin, and eventually it comes up from Southern Europe to, to hit uh, England, but it doesn't hit England until uh, Middle English, until that um, period when the Norman French have taken over and they bring it up with them. Uh, before that, poetry was, was done in alliteration. And you may recognize alliteration. Alliteration is repetition of um, first consonant sounds. Uh, I need to stop having everything in bold. Um, repetition of first consonant sounds. So we're looking at the beginnings of words. Um, a, a good example would be um, Harry hates... Wow, why is it still bold, I swear. Uh, Harry hates hamburgers. Right. Um, in this particular case, you know, you got the H sounds at the beginning of words. Harry hates hamburgers. It creates a alliteration effect. Another example, you know, Sa Sally sold seashells at the seashore. All the s sounds that go through that. Or Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. All the P sounds. Um, uh, Anglo-Saxon one might be swords swung swiftly. Right, and if you look at that, you got this SW thing. Um, this is how the old Anglo-Saxons uh, did their poetry. They didn't rhyme. They didn't have end rhyme. They didn't have anything like Dr. Seussy. Uh, they would connect a series of alliterations, and that would be what's called alliterative verse. So alliterative verse is poetry. Ugh, I cannot spell. Uh, that relies... on uh, alliteration instead of end rhyme. Right, so essentially what you end up doing is you're counting the number of alliterations per line. So a line would tend to have two pair of alliterations. I like to think of it like poker. You have two pair, you have three of a kind, you know, the kind of thing that, that creates a, it makes it memorable. Um, so alliterations are a tool that the Anglo-Saxons use to help their poets memorize all of these these songs and stories. Um, and another tool that they use to help memorize songs and stories is what's called, sorry for all the motion out here, is what's called a seishura. A seishura, if you're, if you're familiar with music or chorus, you may have run into seishura before, but in terms of um, poetry, what a seishura is, is a um, pause, I will say a repeated pause, in the middle of a line of poetry for beat or rhythm. Rhythm's the weirdest word in the English language. R H Y T H M. There's no there's no vowel. Y is the only vowel. Sorry, I'm ADD. It just happens. Um, so a repeated pause in the middle of a line of poetry for beat or rhythm. Uh, so you ever listen to uh, people in the military when they're out doing PT? Um, and they sing songs that have sort of a cadence. I don't know, but I've been told. There's like a pause there. If you don't eat soup, you never grow old. You know, like what, whatever happens next. But there's this pause, and it helps keep everybody in rhythm, um, and it helps people to remember the song. That's what a seishura is, and it shows up in Anglo-Saxon poetry. So you can look at um, Anglo-Saxon poems. Uh, you go back to The Wanderer, and you look at The Wanderer, you see this weird space in the middle of the lines. Um, that space is a seishura. We don't have a punctuation mark for it. Um, they just put a gap in there. And so you'd read it and pause in the middle of the lines, and it creates this rhythmic effect. Um, 
Some people have hypothesized that one of the reasons that um, Anglo-Saxon poetry has satyrs is because they were originally a, a seafaring people. They had boats, kind of like the Vikings, and uh, these boats were propelled by oars. And one of the ways that they kept people in pace was with a cadence. They'd sing songs, they'd tell stories, and the stories would have these satyrs in them. And that's when people would pull the oar of the boat. Uh, and so it would help them travel. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think it's an interesting theory and, and worth considering. Um, so actually i'm gonna i'm gonna pause here and talk about something that uh often gets asked me while i'm in a classroom and i think is also worth talking about um people say hey mr howard hold on you're telling me that like the ancient greeks a guy knew the entire iliad and the odyssey they knew like thousands and thousands of lines of poetry and memorized them all and could retell them and that these these anglo-saxon guys they might know all three thousand lines of beowulf and be able to retell them like what's what's changed why are we so dumb now we can't remember those things anymore is it just that we've written it down and and somehow lost the ability to memorize things no that's that's absolutely not true we still have this incredible ability to memorize um and we just fill it up with junk. Uh, you know, like we for thousands and thousands of years before we knew how to read and write, we had trained our minds to remember things. And we used all kinds of verbal skills to do so. Rhyme is one of them. Alliteration is one of them. Consonance, assonance, uh, meter, uh, anything that, that you can do to help something stick in your head. That's why you remember so many songs. Speaking of which, how many songs do you know the lyrics to in their entirety? Thousands? Maybe. How many commercial jingles and theme songs do you know all the lyrics to? Uh, we have, as a society, found things, especially advertisers, uh, found ways to make our advertisements stick in the minds of the people who watch them. And, and those skills are the same skills that allowed poets to remember their poems back in the day. Nobody was advertising um, in Anglo-Saxon England, but we still had the same skill set. Uh, and so it's interesting that that that's transferred and now our minds are full of i mean think about all the movies too that you know the entire script from we can drop you in the middle of a movie and you can just do the whole thing so you have the same mental capacities as an anglo-saxon we just fill them up with different things and i think that's that's worth mentioning too um so we've got oral tradition alliteration alliterative verse say shura and our last um, term for the day is going to be kenning uh kenning goes back to an old um anglo-saxon word which was ken um, and Ken, the root word of Ken was to know. Actually, this word still exists in um, Scotland. Uh, if you ever watch an old Scottish movie or um, something with Scottish people, they often use the word Ken to know. Like, I can ya. I can, I can understand. You know, like understanding and knowing being with Ken uh, makes sense. And Kenning loosely translates into knowing. And it's this weird literary term that you don't see in a lot of other um, literature. I just I got the willow tree dropping leaves on my head behind me. Um, so a kenning is, uh, as a definition, it's um, a combo when two or more words are combined, often with a hyphen. Actually, when you see two words combined with a hyphen in the Anglo-Saxon poem, it's almost always a kenning. Um, but they're not always combined with a hyphen, so sometimes they're not. Uh, so when two or more words are combined, uh, often with a hyphen, to create a new metaphorical compound word. Um, and the Anglo-Saxons loved doing this stuff. In fact, they, they would used to, uh, like in the winter when they were super bored, they would have competitions to see who could come up with the best kenning to describe something. Uh, let me give you an example. A classic kenning that you see in a lot of Anglo-Saxon literature would be Mead Hall. All right. Uh, people are always always going to the Mead Hall. They're hanging out in the Mead Hall. The Mead Hall is this giant barn in which sort of the king lived and, and in which everybody would um, hang out and... and party and have their civilization uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, why is it called a mead hall? Well, it's it's a big hall, so hall makes sense. Mead is actually an alcoholic beverage distilled from honey. The reason people in Northern Europe had mead as opposed to wine is grapes don't grow very well in Northern Europe and barley, uh, it's not a reliable crop when you have winters and famines and things like that, but there's always bees. And so mead was the drink of choice. And to call this thing a mead hall, it's the hall where people drink. It's the hall where people go to socialize. It creates this happy association um, 
between being in this hall and having sort of like a social um, time. You could call it a great hall. In that case, you're talking about the splendor and the, the size of the hall itself. You'd call it a war hall or a battle hall. And then you see all the men in armor inside of it ready for a ready for a fight. There's lots of different ways to talk about this building, but they often refer to it as the mead hall because they want that association with drinking and happiness and camaraderie and those sorts of things. So that would be one example. Another classic Anglo-Saxon kenning, and I think one of the reasons that we have trouble with Anglo-Saxon kennings is because all the years that have gone by, you know, like these were these were being invented in 450 AD, and now you're in 2000, like 1500 years ago. We don't drink mead. We don't live in barns anymore. Another example would be um, uh, whale road. A lot of times they talk about the whale road. So what is a whale road? Well, it turns out that if you said the ocean, you're not far off. Um, you know, whales live in the ocean, and uh, this idea of a road, an ocean certainly not a road, it's just a vast plain. So what, where does the road come in? Well, it turns out that there are these things in the ocean, we, we call them trade routes sometimes, that's also a compound word, but there are these currents in the ocean that tend to travel from one place to another. Um, and uh, if you're a sailor on a boat and you want to get somewhere fast, you want to get in with the current that's taking you in the right direction. And so the uh, old Anglo-Saxons and Vikings uh, they would look for these currents. And the, the easiest way to find the currents was actually to find the whales, because whales aren't stupid. They don't want to do extra swimming. They tend to find these currents and use them to travel faster as well. And so if you could find the whales, you could find the road, and these trade routes were called whale roads in... Um, you know, that's that's just sort of how they got named. Uh, and that's that's interesting. So it's a cool sort of metaphorical compound word, because instead of just saying trade route, or the ocean, we picture the whales sounding and people finding them, and like you get all of this additional information from a kenning like whale road. Um, and it turns out that the Germanic languages love compound words, and compound words have sort of become a thing. In German, they compound a ridiculous number of words even today. And and in English, we compound words all the time too. I mean, think about all the all the especially sea creatures. The Vikings named sea creatures, so you get things like sea lion and seahorse, um, and you know, those sorts of things all, all the time. Um, iceberg, it's ice, berg is a town, so it's like an ice town, right? Like, so all of these kinds of things were named by the Anglo-Saxons, well, or they're, they're did I spell that wrong? Um, I'm good at spelling things wrong, uh, there we go. Uh, you know, and, and you, can, you can look at that, but we've also got classic um, phrases, Deathbed is an old Anglo-Saxon kenning that got combined into one word. We now say somebody's on their deathbed. Battlefield. We've got a high school named Battlefield, but that's an old Anglo-Saxon word that used to be a kenning, the field of battle, um, that is now a single word. So uh, we do this kind of stuff all the time, and it's, it's something that you should be familiar with. So I'm going to give you a kenning activity. We're going to close off today. This is the end of the lecture, um, but I'm going to send you on to a kenning activity. You're going to go to a discussion board. And um, I'll, I'll just see if I can write the activity here um, and give you the instructions in person rather than having to type them all out. Uh, but essentially what you're going to do is I want you to think about three animals, three animals that you really enjoy. Um, we'll say three fa Ugh, Why does everything have to be difficult? Um, three animals that you enjoy or like that three favorite animals. Let's go with three favorite animals. Okay. Um, and then I want you to think of a kenning for each. Remember that a kenning is two words, sometimes more, um, connected by a hyphen. And you're going to try and write that down. So the word should capture the poetic essence of the animal. And so you're going to think about a kenning for each of these animals and you'll put them, we're going to have a discussion board and you'll put the kenning up in the discussion board, right? And um, then everybody else is going to try and guess what the, what the kenning means. Uh, so like, let me give you a couple of examples that are, are good ones. Like if I were to say, um, and this is starting to go off the bottom of the page again, so 
I were to say tuxedo bird, right? That's clearly a penguin. You can picture it, a tuxedo bird. Aha, right? Like that captures the essence of, of what a penguin looks like. You gotta, if you're going to do penguin, you're going to have to come up with a new one. No using mine. Um, if I were to say, um, I don't know, a, a convict horse, all right? Um, hopefully you go straight to a zebra with that. You know, convicts used to wear these black and white striped uh, outfits, and a zebra is black and white striped, so that sort of makes sense. Um, you know, if I was going to look at a... a Let's say I was going to do a baboon. What am I going to think of for a, a kenning for a baboon? I might call it a fang monkey. You picture the baboons with their big front fangs. You know, like, that's that's scary. Um, you know, if you wanted a more comical representation of a baboon, you might call it a blue butt. You know, because they have these big blue butts behind them. It's kind of funny when they're walking the other direction. When they're coming at you with their fangs, you're scared. The other one's sort of comical. And so you could have either representation of a a baboon as a kenning. So your job is to go try and find kennings. A couple of words of caution. I've taught 12th grade many, many times, and I know how some 12th graders are. Folks, I keep these clean. I don't want to see you do a kenning for a squirrel and call it a bush nut. Okay, that's out. Try not to get, you know, be, be mature about this. Also, don't be racist with your kennings. I, I had a kid one year do a polar bear, and he called it white power. I'm like, there's no need for that. So, you know, like, let's try and be mature, and we can have fun with it without getting either off color or or immature in other ways. So I'm going to send you off. Go go try and come up with some kennings and put them in the feed, and we'll try and guess. The goal is that people can guess it. If they can't guess it, you maybe didn't capture the poetic essence of the animal well enough. Um, so give that a shot. Thanks.